Okay, previously we made the assumption that uh, uh, I have a BMO credit card, so my, my bank is Bank of Montreal, and Best Buy also dealt with the Bank of Montreal. That was the basic assumption. Well, what happens if Best Buy doesn't deal with the Bank of Montreal? For example, let's say Best Buy has its accounts with the CIBC. And well, then this changes things considerably because now it's not internal to the Bank of Montreal. So let's see what happens now. Uh, so I go to Best Buy, I buy my Chromebook, I leave uh, my credit card slip, my credit card I take with me, but I leave the credit card slip with uh, Best Buy. And then Best Buy now takes, at the end of the day, the other cash and various things, financial paper it's received, it makes a deposit at its own bank, CIBC. Now, what does CIBC do with this credit card slip from the bank, in effect, from the Bank of Montreal? Well, CIBC doesn't want this piece of paper. Uh, it doesn't pay any interest to CIBC. So the CIBC is going to take this $200 credit card slip and go to the Bank of Montreal and say, hey, we want the $200. In this case now, actual Consider actual money is involved. Now, between the banks themselves, the Bank of Montreal can say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll give you the $200, we'll give you this new type of financial paper, different. The banks, the only type of financial paper they accept for payment for these kinds of things is the actual cash. Think of it as the $20 with the picture of the queen on it, the green amount. So, in this case, what happens? 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, does the Bank of Montreal hand over the $200 to CIBC? cash, if you will? Well, not quite, because you can sort of imagine this, is that I think a CIBC uses Visa. So imagine sometime during the day, I don't know, a, a CIBC customer uh, with a VIC Visa card went to PharmaPre and they bought for, I don't know, $300 worth of stuff. Now imagine further that PharmaPre has its accounts with the Bank of Montreal. So in effect, when the CIBC shows up with my credit card slip and says, hey, you owe us 200 bucks, the Bank of Montreal might respond and say, no, 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 no. We don't owe you $200, you owe us $300. Now this can get really confusing because you've got different credit card slips going to different banks and so on. But in effect, what happens is all of the banks collect during the day different types of financial paper. If it's within their own bank, then not an issue. They just change the accounts amongst their customers. But if it's on a different bank, they collect them all, stack them up against each one, CIBC, Toronto Dominion Bank, RBC, and so on. And they go to each of the banks and they say, you owe us this amount. Well, you owe us this amount. And so they settle up their accounts. And the place that happened that this, this, this occurs is called a clearinghouse. In Canada, it's called the uh, Canadian Payments Association. It's organized by the, uh, the Bank of Canada. And each of the banks, in effect, during the day, they do this every night. I don't know. They, they actually used to meet someplace a long time ago, uh, but now it's done by computer. But they, uh, they, they collect all the bits of paper during the day and uh, they settle out the amount that they owe or may receive from the other banks. Um, and as a result, each of the banks keeps these cash reserves in the event that they may have to pay out money instead of receiving it. And in advance, they don't really know uh, how much they may have to pay out or receive. Incidentally, I provided a, a link to uh, a movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can, uh, which describes the clearinghouse system in the United States in the early 1960s. It's a bit more complicated there because they actually have 12 clearinghouses uh, according to the U.S. Federal Reserve System. And by the way, the system I'm describing here it was invented in Italy, uh, originally in Florence and then in, in Venice, and went to Holland. And uh, what we use in Canada is a system kind of based on what the British did, uh, it's, and it's organized by the Bank of, Bank of England. Uh, now, question for the Bank of Montreal is, well, what cash reserves, to, how sh large are these cash reserves to be? Uh, and you sort of imagine a bit like a poker mat, poker game, a bunch of guys meet on Friday nights, they play poker, and in events you don't know whether you're going to get good cards or bad cards, so you have to show up with cash. Uh, uh, and like a poker game, you can't write an IOU. I mean, uh, no, you have to have sufficient cash to be able to sit at the table. So uh, the Bank of Montreal wants to keep its cash reserves small, because cash doesn't pay interest, but it has to have the sufficient cash reserves in the event that, I don't know, they have all the other banks are showing up with these bits of paper, credit card slips and checks and so on. So to do the, the number crunching, Bank of Montreal would look, for example, at the number of credit cards it's issued to customers. And then the key number, if you have a credit card, you'll know about this. It's the credit limit on the card, because in a sense, that's the maximum amount of damage or the amount of you can spend your money during the day uh, um, if you go to other stores and 
those bits of credit card slips will come back to the Bank of Montreal. I don't think the Bank of Montreal is worried too much about credit cards and credit limits, but it would be seriously concerned about a checking account uh, because the number of checking accounts with its customers and in particular the amount, that's a number, uh, on the screen that the person in effect could write a check up to that amount, in which case it could be deposited with another bank and then that bank, TD, RBC or whatever, could come back to the Montreal uh, Bank of Montreal at night in the clearinghouse and say, hey, you have to settle up for this amount here. Another key number that the banks would be look, Bank of Montreal would be looking at is the line of credit. Line of credit is very much like a checking account. A person could write a check up to the amount of the line of credit. So they have to do a sophisticated statistical formula, do calculations and decide whether or not they should have cash reserves. Of course, they want to keep them small. Cash doesn't pay interest. So they want to have them small, but then not too small. Now, what happens if they have too much cash, excess cash reserves? What do they do? Well, what happens if they have insufficient cash reserves? And that's going to be the topic of the next lecture. But before I go there, I just want to finish with this last point. Uh, the standard definition, the textbook definition of money is that, uh, first of all, it's a means of exchange and it's a store of value. But that applies to all financial paper. We've seen, for example, a credit card slip type of financial paper. You can go and get a, a Chromebook at a Best Buy. So that's a means of exchange. Store of value. Well, if you hold on to financial paper, it's a claim on something real and you believe you can get something real for it in the future. In general, you expect to be compensated because you're giving up the real thing. An example of something like this would be a government bond or stock shares, these kinds of things. Um, finally, a unit of account. Well, if we think of it this way, is that the only, this one makes money, if call it money, different from the first two examples or other types of financial paper. In the sense of a unit of account, it's, money is a special type of financial paper that is used within a clearinghouse to settle up accounts between the banks themselves. And in fact, in Canada, it's, if you think of it as a, the, the $20 bill with a picture of the queen, but it's also in effect a, a, a deposits with the Bank of Canada on behalf of these different financial institutions. And that's what they use to settle between themselves. Another way to think about this too is that there, what about an international transaction? Well, there's international clearing houses that in effect, if you write a check in the United States or in Europe or use a credit card abroad, it has to come back through a settlement system and it's done internationally. Uh, and for those kind of settlements, uh, they use uh, what's called a reserve currency. And typically that's US dollars. Although I suppose in Europe, they also use euros. And then of course in Asia, they might be using Japanese yen. These are the primary reserve currencies around the world. And so this is what we mean by an international currency or international money. Mm -hmm.